welcome back to your second hour, Stuck With Me. Um, and today we're actually going, well, in this lecture, we're actually going to do some cryptography. Are you excited? So um, after two hours of prelude, I'm finally getting around to doing some actual math, actual crypt analysis, actual attacks. Okay. Um, so this lecture is about RSA, DSA, and ECDSA disasters. And so I'm going to start by reviewing all of the crypto that you already know. Um, so just so we get our notation straight and our ideas straight in our head, um, here's the textbook RSA. Um, so RSA, your private key is two primes P and Q. Your public key is the product of P and Q. So you have your modulus N um, and in some encryption exponent E. And E needs to be relatively prime to um, V of M, P minus 1. Q minus 1. Um, your decryption exponent is E inverse mod V of N. So encryption, of course, um, if Alice wants to encrypt to Bob, Bob sends his public key and an E. Yes? Move this one. It's just oh, hitting my head. OK. Is that better? OK. Good. OK. Um, and the encryption of a message um, is the message has been padded properly, um, raised to the eth power, mod n, and that's your ciphertext. So the only relevant part for this talk is that the factorization of n gives you the private key d, because if you know p and q, then and you know e, then you just compute e inverse mod p minus 1 q minus 1. So that is, that is all we need to know. Um, signing, of course, is um, you raise your message to the, to, to sign a message, you raise it to the dth power mod n. Um, so again, anybody with the factorization of n knows d, and they can forward a signature. So if we're starting to look for problems, um, question number one you might ask is, um, you know, if you look at the textbook RSA description, they say, you know, choose a random, um, random P and Q, choose a random E. That's not actually what people do in practice. In practice, people use small E, and in fact, everybody uses basically the same E. So this is a list of the E values that appear in the public keys of TLS certificates. Um, this is from the 2011 data set. So you can see that basically everyone uses the value E equals 65537. Yes? By the way, did anyone use one? <laughs> one or two. Um, there are some strange things happening here, like this one. Um, I, th I think there are one or two ones, but I could be wrong. This list goes on for a long time. So people are choosing these weird sporadic small values. I don't know why. Nobody uses any values larger than 32 bits for E, incidentally. Apparently, I think old versions of Internet Explorer wouldn't accept values of E larger than 32 bits. If you look for uh, SSH E values, the distribution is different. Um, I think 23 is a common E value for SSH, as well as 65537. But basically, um, uh, repeated E values are not actually a problem because, um, I don't know, the, the, if you have a factorization of the modulus, you can compute um, the private key corresponding to any E you would like. So this part doesn't necessarily matter. Um, now, are repeated public moduli a problem? Um, yes. Um, if two hosts share the same n, um, then, and they both have the, the private key, um, then they both know the private key of the other person um, because factorization is unique. Um, and it doesn't matter whether the modulus is different in this case because um, you can compute the, uh, the inverse of, of any e you would like, as I just said. So, um, two hosts share n, the, the um, this is a problem um, for multiple reasons. So um, any, any hosts here who share the same public and private keys can decrypt and sign for each other. Now, this should never happen. 
um, but it does. Uh, so from a theoretical perspective, you think, well, okay, two people are generating um, P and Q uniformly at random from a large space. They should never get a collision. And that's not what the actual practice of public key cryptography looks like. Um, so we already saw in the last lecture that there were far fewer certificates than there were um, hosts that uh, successfully did TLS with us. Um, but more than just repeated certificates, um, we have repeated public keys across um, distinct certificates. And there are actually a bunch of reasons why this might not actually be a vulnerability, even though it looks like one. So um, a common situation is that um, virtual hosting providers might have a single TLS gateway that will lead to um, a bunch of different IP addresses that are all within the same space. Um, and if they, for whatever reason, are choosing to use the same um, public and private keys for all of the, say, domains that are hosted behind their TLS gateway, but they control their own TLS infrastructure, that's not necessarily a problem. Um, and for, for whatever reason, this is extremely common. Um, another situation is that a single organization might register many domain names for using the same key. So google.com, google.org, google.fr, google whatever, um, will all have the same key, askspot.com, blogspot.com. Um, distinct TLS certificates, same key, but if we trust Google to control their own TLS infrastructure, then this might not actually be a problem. And there are reasons that you might want to do this. For example, if you have some um, accelerator box that has some built-in key and hardware or whatever, um, then it's much easier to do all of those encryption decryptions with, with a single key. Um, we also see a lot of expired certificates that are renewed with the same public key. This is not usually a problem, although I have heard that um, after the Heartbleed vulnerability, many people were told you need to um, get new certificates because your, your private keys might have been compromised. And a very, very large number of people went and got new certificates with the same key. So this is, this is the problem with, um, I don't know, public, uh, public education about cryptography. Um, crypto is hard and people screw it up. So, yeah. Okay. Um, there are also a bunch of common reasons that do count as vulnerabilities or that I will characterize as vulnerabilities for people to share the same keys. Um, one of them, you saw all these repeated certificates. A lot of them are repeated because they are built in, they are burned into the firmware of devices. So devices will come, they will have um, the ability to do TLS, and they will just have a, a fixed certificate that is the same for every model of that device or every, every particular device out there of the, of the same model. And um, so they will do encryption, but with a fixed key that never changes, and then anybody who goes and purchases that router will have the private key for it. Um, and the last thing is that um, we also see what looks like entropy problems in key generation. And my characterization of entropy problems in key generation here is, in this case, very loose. Um, it's mostly just that if we see things that look like device default certificates where everything has the same uh, certificate subject, but you see, say, what looks like a random distribution of moduli that, you know, sort of, this is the most common one and, the, and it decreases like that, that looks like a, an entropy problem. So I will wave my hands and call that an entropy problem. And so manually counting these things, because I don't have a better methodology, this is something that I'm sort of thinking about. Um, so for the HTTPS scans, um, we manually characterized device default certificates um, at about 5% of hosts. This is a massive lower bound. Um, and low entropy repeated keys at about 0.3% of hosts. This is a really, really massive lower bound. This is like me saying, okay, this collection of certificates actually looks like it's an entropy problem. For SSH, um, it is harder to distinguish um, default keys that have been burned in from low entropy keys just because of the amount of information that we get in a um, TLS certificate versus a, um, an SSH box that might just give us a version string. Um, 
So I can't really distinguish default keys from low entropy keys, but a lower bound is um, about 10% or a million hosts that have one or the other of their SSH keys in this box. Yeah? How did you measure the entropy in this case? Um, Just show the, the intuition is that if I look for all certificates that have a particular um, uh, a particular set of subjects that say like this brand of router, and if I look at the frequency of the different moduli, um, uh, and it looks something like this, um, so these are distinct moduli, and I order them from most to least common, and it looks like that, that looks like an entropy problem. I don't know how bad of the, an entry problem it is, but if you have like a thousand things that all share one key and then um, 900 that share the next most common key, that looks like somebody has some problems generating keys. This is totally non-rigorous. Okay, but it's an intuition. Yeah. And do, do you have information about the distinct entities possessing the not unique public keys in the internet? Not the gateway, not the other big, they may be behind the net or something, but really the, the entities, the physical difficult, different services share or which may share the key? Um, what do you want to do? There are a lot of them. So if I, if I look at things that are not in the same AS, so like not even in the yes. same, same network, um, a lot of, if you, if you look at keys that are shared across different networks, they basically <coughs> are all devices. And they are clearly all devices. Um, I will show you in a second. So these are, this is not repeated keys, this is repeated certificates, but this is what you see if you look at the most repeated certificates. Um, this is the subject. And you can see that these are all, um, so Draytech Corporation, that's a router company, Broadcom, Broadband, um, AD Trend, Accenture Server, Netgear, um, Dell Remote Access Group. So these are all devices. And if you see something with a, a certificate subject that looks like this, and you see a distribution of keys that looks like this, and you see that they are all over the, the internet at like completely random intervals, then these are, it's not the same organization, it's the particular <coughs> device that is generating its keys and it has some issues. So this is the intuition. In a lot of cases I can't prove it, but it's, I mean, it seems pretty clear. If everybody has the same key, like exactly the same key, um, then that looks like a key that's been burned into the firmware. So it was just generated as, as part of, as making the router, and it was burned in, and everybody just serves, serves the same key. This is extremely common. Any more questions? Common name. So the, um, the common name is usually the, um, if you look at a normal, um, a, a normal TLS certificate for a website that you're connecting to, the common name will be like um, google.com. So in this case, they're setting um, uh, like country, state, organization, they're setting them to, to arbitrary values. Yeah? Do you simply justify why it's extremely common that devices just share the private share the modules without having reason for that. It's just a poor, poor design. The, the developer has just generated a certificate and, and put it into the, the oh. software. Or they generated a key and they just put it into the software. Key once and distributed it all yep. the device. That's because they were Yeah, they didn't want to, to generate their own. Okay. They chose not to generate so their no own. So no magic behind it. They're just they design decision for them. Yeah, so there, there's two design decisions. One of them is, do you just put a key into the routers and they all, just, they all just use the same key for all their encryption? Or do you ask the routers to generate their own key? In which case, um, they may have some entropy problems. You as I go ahead Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm trying to, in some sense, winnow out 
I'm saying, well, okay, device default certificates, that is a vulnerability, but that's a sort of boring vulnerability. You can just go and download databases of private keys for device default certificates if you want. These exist on the internet. Um, you can plug them into Wireshark, and uh, you should not be wiretapping, by the way, so don't do this. But it is theoretically possible for someone to um, download the database of these keys, um, plug it into Wireshark, and then look at a large network and then decrypt traffic going to various devices because of the default keys. That's a cryptographically boring problem. Yeah. So I'm separating those things out, and then I'm trying to sort of winnow down into the cryptographically interesting problem, for example, <coughs> entropy, entropy issues and key generation. OK, so here we have devices. And I hope this, this makes it clear like what I mean by being able to look at a subject or look at some kind of device and say, this is totally a device, because it says that it was made by Dell. And it says that it belongs to this. And it says that it's probably this model number or whatever. So non-rigorous, but you, you can see what I'm doing here. Um, here's the um, most repeated trusted TLS certificates. Um, and if you look at the, uh, this is a field in the certificate, um, but it gives the DNS entries for a lot of different hosting providers and large organizations. So you can see that these certificates belong to basically all large hosting providers. So this is also what I mean by if you see a certificate that's repeated across a bunch of different networks, or if you see a, repeat, a certificate that's repeated across a bunch of different IP addresses, but they are all within the same or a handful of ASs, and they have something like this in the certificate, and they all resolve to the same um, few hosting providers, then you say, well, they probably control their own infrastructure, and this is probably OK. So this is sort of what hosting provider <laughs> repeated keys look like. Um, for SSH keys, it's a little bit more complicated because you don't have as much information. But I went through and manually classified the most repeated SSH host keys. Um, and. The single most repeated one belongs to Varia, which is a large hosting provider. It appeared on about 200,000 different IP addresses, all serving the same SSH host key. But my parents happened to have an account on Varia, so I went in and looked whether I could actually see the, the private key, and I couldn't. So I decided that was probably OK. Um, the next most common public key is a router. And here I've put in, it's a little hard to see the colors, but in red are um, things that were obviously devices, and blue are things that are obviously hosting providers. So you can see that, again, SSH keys. Um, there are a few exceptions where I couldn't figure out what it was or why they were repeated. Um, but almost all of them are obviously hosting providers or obviously devices. Um, you might ask, how many of these um, repeated keys? I told you about this Debian disaster. Um, how many of these repeated keys are actually due to um, Debian OpenSSL hosts that um, generated their keys between 2006 and 2008? Um, and the answer is not that many, but a, a still measurable percentage. So it's about 0.3% of all of the RSA SSH hosts um, have, are, are serving Debian keys. Um, and for certificates, um, Starting in 2012, the percentage was about 0.06%. Um, and browser trusted certificates, um, you can see that the certificate authorities are still not checking for Debian keys here, if they're still willing to sign um, certificates with weak Debian keys. Um, but the frequency has been steadily de declining over time, just naturally, as people regenerate their keys. Um, this huge incidence of repeated keys um, is definitely, like the low entropy keys, is definitely not all due to the Debian problem. Yeah? Are any of those um, Debian weak keys that are trusted by browsers recently issued, or are they all sort of old certificates from back in the day? They are not old certificates. So um, certificate authorities, um, at least as of 2011, were still willing to sign um, certificates containing Debian weak keys. So they were just not checking for it. Um, 
another, this is just a sporadic incident, but um, <coughs> who recognizes this certificate? <coughs> what is this? I recognize the name. You recognize the name? Demo that I saw or some, something from Windows. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I see it. Any other suggestions of what, what the certificate is? So it's uh, snakeoil.dom. Is it the snake oil crypto composition? This is the default certificate if you install um, Apache, the Apache web server, and you turn on TLS. Then it will give. It comes with a, a default um, certificate for Snake Oil Dom, Snake Desert, Snake Town, Snake Oil Limited, um, and it has you know a, a fixed key, and everybody will have the same certificate. So we see a lot of these certificates out there <coughs> because people just turn on um, their HTTP server and they they haven't put anything there yet, which is fine, except that some of the keys here are not being served. Um, if you look for things that are repeating this key, they're not using this common name, snakeoil.dom. They have somehow managed to take this key, put it into their own certificate, and get that signed by a certificate authority for their actual real website. I don't know how people manage to do this, <laughs> but this is another illustration that crypto is hard and users are very creative. Um, and I don't know how to protect against these, this kind of thing. But certificate authorities were also clearly not checking for this because some of the certificates that were serving the key from the um, default Apache install um, were signed by certificate authorities. Yeah? I think it's quite easy actually to, to do that. So you just, there's an open SSL command line tool which enables you to create a certificate signing request mm -hmm. incorporating any public key which you then send to a CA, and the CA will send you back a certificate if you also give them your credit card number. So you have to somehow um, get the key out of this certificate and then Yeah, but put it I guess it's a public key that's in some file somewhere, which mm -hmm. you then just feed into the certificate request command line option and off you go. So I think it's probably easily done. So maybe somebody was just following some instructions yeah. that were using this and, and they didn't <laughs> follow the part where it said generate your generate own Generate your own key. key. Exactly. I think you just need uh, access to the CD. Okay. So they found the secret key. Was that another hand back there? Okay. Anyway, yes. Um, the problems in the certificate infrastructure are many and interesting. We found this by looking for repeated keys across many different um, domains that were um, not related by AS or anything. There were also some devices, <coughs> um, remote access devices, where they came with a default certificate um, that was just self-signed, and then people could, if they wanted, generate different certificates and get those signed by a certificate authority. And um, people had taken the keys from the default certificates and gotten them signed for the certificate authority, so for, for their actual trusted certificates. <coughs> so, not just an, a problem with Apache. Um, so, um, one thing that I looked for that I didn't find, I think this is the only thing I'm going to talk about that like, I was like, wouldn't this be funny, and I, I, I couldn't find it. So there's a, um, a fun textbook RSA vulnerability, where I said it's not really a problem if, um, well, okay, so, so if, if two different hosts share the same modulus and have different E, well, okay, they, they still know the factorization of N, so they can just compute the private keys for each other. But there's actually a problem with textbook RSA in this case, um, which is that, Okay, so we have two hosts sharing N. Um, they have a different modulus. Um, we, as the outside observer, can just see these two different these two hosts share N. They can compromise each other's traffic, but I can't, um, except that I can. So if you imagine that the same message was encrypted to both hosts using, oh, or no, this should be E underscore one. I think I had some bracket problems. Um, oh, you, you get the point, but it, it should be like, um, M to the E1 and M to the E2. Um, then, um, so if E1 and E2 are relatively prime, then we can, um, using extended Euclidean algorithm, um, write A1 plus BE2 equals one. 
And then if we take the two different ciphertexts here, C1 to the A, C2 to the B, um, then we get M to the A E1, M to the B E2, and A E1 plus B E2 is equals one, so this is equal to M mod N. So this is, this is one of those cute <laughs> things that they, they show you in um, your intro crypto class of why textbook RSA is insecure. Right? Um, and so I thought, wouldn't it be funny if two hosts shared an N and had different E's? And I looked for it, and I didn't find any. So, too bad. Um, in, in reality, um, in order for this to happen, you would have to have multiple entropy problems because PKCS um, number one padding is randomized um, here. So, and also in practice, what you're encrypting is what should be random session keys. So maybe you don't have an issue. Okay. Um, now another problem that um, you might think to look for. Um, so if two RSA moduli are not exactly the same, but they're almost the same, so they have one prime factor in common and, and one prime factor different, um, then you can compute the GCD of each of these and get the prime factor that's shared, and then you can divide out and get the prime factorization of each. And this is as an external observer. So if for some reason you find two RSA moduli that share exactly one prime factor in common, then the external observer can factor both of them. And this is relevant because, of course, factorization is, we hope, hard. Um, it takes, as we know, I don't know, two and a half calendar years um, and a lot of computers um, and some cleverness to factor a 768-bit RSA modulus. This is a few years old. Um, it takes, I don't know, maybe a million dollars and a lot of cleverness to factor a 1024-bit RSA key with, with current technology, um, which is why I guess nobody has bothered to do it yet because we don't have the million dollars. Um, Whereas, in contrast, it takes about 15 microseconds to compute the GCD of two 1024-bit RSA moduli on my computer. A little bit of a time. So, I should have put this earlier, like whether you expect two RSA moduli to, to collide with both factors. But you can ask the question, um, if we were to do the experiment, of we take um, all of the RSA moduli that we have collected off the internet, and we compute the GCDs of each pair of RSA moduli, do we expect to find any collisions? Like, for um, randomly generated, realistically sized RSA keys, what is the probability that we would randomly generate a collision? And what, what you should find is nothing. Um, so you can do this analysis. We know from the prime number theorem that there are about um, n over log n um, n bit, or uh, if, if the prime is, if your prime <coughs> is n, then we have n over log n um, primes of that size. Um, so this is about 10 to the 150, 512 bit primes. Um, and then um, we can then do a birthday bound analysis. So uh, what we have here is we have. Um, each modulus, we're taking, we have two balls, which are two uniformly generated primes, and we are throwing them into um, n bins, where um, the bins is the number of 512-bit primes. And then we ask, um, what is the probability that we get a collision? And so you can, I hope you've all seen this before. Everybody's happy with birthday bound analysis. Basically, you expect to find a collision once you get about square root of n. Um, balls thrown into your bins. This is the same reason why um, baby step, giant step, and Pollard row work um, that we were learning about yesterday. Um, so the probability that you get two prime balls in the same bin um, is one minus e to the negative two m squared over p. p is the number of primes, m is the number of moduli, and this is just, um, there's two m moduli per, per ball. Per Two m primes per modulus. Okay. Two primes per modulus. Okay. I can speak. Now, um, I have plotted this function for you conveniently down here, so you can visualize it um, for 512-bit primes. So, this is the probability of getting a non-trivial GCD um, 
when you have this many moduli. So this probability is astronomically small until you get to um, somewhere between 10 to the 70 and 10 to the 80. And um, here are some waypoints for you. So here's the population of Earth. So we're still okay if every person on Earth has and ours has their own TLS certificate. Here's the number of atoms in Earth. We're still okay if every atom on Earth has its own RSA key. Um, here's the number of atoms in the universe. We're not okay if every atom in the universe has its own RSA key. So if you're going to have an Internet of Things for every <laughs> atom in the universe, you should move away from 1024-bit RSA. But until then, we're okay. In theory. Now, forging on ahead, despite the fact that we've just proved that this experiment will show nothing on our data set, we will do it anyway. So how do we do this experiment? Um, okay, step number one is we need to know how to compute GCDs. Um, fortunately, we've known how to compute GCDs for a couple thousand years. We can use Euclid's algorithm. Here's Euclid's algorithm up here. Um, and um, Euclid's algorithm is about quadratic in the number of bits of, if you put in two things of the same size, quadratic in the number of bits. Um, so that's good. Um, the problem is that this is not as good as you can do. Um, so you can do much better if you have fast integer arithmetic. Um, so instead of being quadratic, you can do compute GCDs in n log squared n log log n time. So multiplication is like n log n log log n. That's cool. If you would like a very nice survey on um, all of the great things that you can do with fast integer arithmetic, you can read the survey by Dan Bernstein. It's very educational. Okay. Now, we have faster um, GCDs. Well, we still need to compute the GCDs of each pair of RSA moduli. Um, so the naive way to do it is for all pairs of moduli Ni and Nj. Um, compute the GCD of Ni and Nj. If that's not one, then we add it to a list of interesting pairs of RSA moduli that we can factor. Okay, and you can think of, of ways to do this that, that might be more clever. You try to be more clever. Well, let's just like multiply, you know, half of them together and, and check that. Um, but you're not gonna actually <coughs> do that much better because the GCD computation, I mean, if you multiply half of your, your integers together and the other half of your integers, you have a gigantic thing and another gigantic thing and um, you're still roughly quadratic time in the number of total input bits that you get. So um, this algorithm we have um, in the li gigantic list of RSA moduli that I had before, we had about uh, 14 million RSA moduli. Um, so we have 14 million choose two pairs. Um, if each GCD calculation takes 15 microseconds, then this would take about 1,100 years, which is not out of the question if you have a gigantic computer and throw it at it. But you can do better than having a gigantic computer and throwing it at this problem using a naive algorithm. So we're not gonna do this. What we do instead is we can um, implement a much more efficient algorithm, which will accomplish the same goal. Um, so this is a collection of um, what are apparently well-known techniques in sort of computational um, arithmetic number theory um, that I was totally unaware of before starting this problem. Um, so these are fun things to learn, uh, just in case. So um, the first step, of, this is a picture of the algorithm. I'll explain it step by step. So the first step is you, um, we have all of our input moduli, so four equals a very large number of m, but imagine that 4 equals m. Um, and we compute the product of all of our input moduli using a product tree. So you just compute a, a binary tree, you take each pair of numbers, you um, take the product, then you take the products of those, then you take the products of those. So each line here costs approximately the same amount of time. So we have m input moduli, so we do m over 2, um, n bit multiplications, and then we do m over 4, 2 n bit multiplications, and, and continue on like that. And so, since we have this um, almost linear multiplication time, we, we're collecting some log factors, but basically, each row here in the product tree takes about the same amount of time. So, we can we get 
a log m, we get log m um, uh, rows in our product tree, but then at the end we can compute this product in essentially um, log m times a bunch of log n, or n, n log n uh, time things. Does that make sense? So, and we, we save all of these, um, we save our entire product tree here. So step number two, once we've computed the product of every RSA modulus on the internet, this is a very large number, um, is we then mod out by the squares of each of the um, elements in our product tree. So um, this is called a remainder tree. So this node here is n1, n2, n3, n4 mod n1 squared n2 squared. And each of these um, is also a relatively fast operation. And this is about the same size as this. So we're doing um, something that is you know, n, uh, well, this is mn size. So we do two mn uh, sized operations um, of modular reduction, which is, I forget whether there's, it's like n log n or n log squared n, but it's one of those. Um, and then, so we get something that's um, mn sized, and then we get something, that, then we take the mod by something that's um, mn over 2 sized, and continue out like this. So with this last step here, um, this is equal to n1, n2, n3, n4 mod n1 squared. And this, this node here is n1, n2, n3, n4 mod n2 squared, and so on and so forth. Now, each of these is, um, if we had n bit inputs, say small n, I need better notation here, um, small n, then um, each of these is 2n sized. So we've gone, we've gone from a gigantic thing back down to m relatively small things. Um, and again, we have um, log m nodes in our remainder tree because we're doing this binary tree on m things. Now, at this point, we have um, n1, n2, n3, n4 mod n1 squared. If we divide out by n1, then we get n2, n3, n4 mod n1. Just and we can do that for each of these, and we're doing a, um, each of these nodes, we're doing m of, m of these, but each of these is still arithmetic just on n bit things, essentially. And at this point we get um, the, so the product, we get the product of everything but n1, um, mod n1, and we can take the GCD of that with n1, which since GCD is just taking, if you were going to start with GCD of everything but n1 and n1, step one would be, take, would be to reduce the larger element mod the, the smaller element. And so taking the GCD of everything else mod n1 and n1 is the same as, as taking the GCD of everything but n1 and n1. So this is equal to the GCD of everything else in n1. So if this is non-zero, this tells us that n1 has a non-trivial GCD with something else in the tree. And so this will either be a factor of n1, or it will be exactly n1, which tells us that both factors of n1 are somewhere in the tree. And we can go out and, um, assuming we have a relatively small number of these, we can just individually try each one and, and then get the factorization of n. So we get m of these guys, and basically look for the non-trivial common divisors here, and then keep separating out until we actually get the factorization. So this, um, the running time of this algorithm, we have, um, as I was saying, basically each row here is mn polylog time, and we get another um, log m for the number of, of rows. And so I'm throwing away a lot of logs, I'm throwing away some other things, but it's basically mn polylog um, mn time. And so this is uh, linear times um, some logs in the number of input bits that we had, which was mn. And in contrast to taking multiple years, um, this actually only takes a few hours to run on our data sets. So this is the power of computational complexity. And I have an implementation which is available here if you want to play with it yourself. Yeah? <laughs>
this is fine, but it's probably suboptimal. You can probably gain a factor of two. I thought you can. Uh, well, you, you can pro you can <coughs> easily get rid of all the, those squares, which are just messing up things. How do you get rid of the squares? So you, what you want to do is, uh, in fact, you well, uh, instead of doing two separate steps, uh, you can do a single uh, a single product tree algorithm, which will which will work as follows. Every time you have two nodes and you want to merge them into their product, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just directly merging them into the product, you compute the GCD. And if it's one, you just take the product. If it's not one, you put the LCM as the next node. And once you learn that the GCD is not one, then you propagate it down the subtree mm -hmm. on each side. And uh, doing this, you avoid the, the squares and you get something which is <coughs> a little bit more efficient. We were optimizing developer time and, uh, and running time. Um, so this is, so I bet actually some, some of the things that I'm doing are large enough that it's probably, it's probably worth doing this at this point because factors of two are starting to get annoying right. for things that are taking a day. Um, for, the, for the first case, I was only running it on like five million things and this finished in, in a few um, hours, so that's. Um, it's not really more difficult to implement what I just suggested yeah. that is. The size of this big product, N1 up to N4 and beyond, it, it's something like 10 gigabits or something, right? When you, it's, I think it's like 14 gigabits or something, because there's 14 million of them and multiply them. Yeah, so you so need a you, big hard disk, right. and it also doesn't fit in RAM. I was going to ask, how do you do the multiplication without a big enough RAM? To do um, you need a lot of RAM. So uh, if you don't have enough RAM on your own computer, you can go rent an Amazon EC2 computer that will have um, 80 gigabytes of, of RAM. Okay. Um, and um, the, this was one of the, the problems that we ran into in running this the first time, which is that the product tree won't fit in RAM, so we had to write each node of the product tree to disk as we were computing it out, and then read it back in again, which is like incredibly time consuming if you have a slow disk. Um, another problem that we ran into in implementing was that we were writing this to disk, implementing it at GMP, um, the GNU multi-precision. If you're doing any fast arithmetic, you want to use this, <coughs> this library, um, open source uh, free software. Um, so this number was larger. So, um, so GMP uses a signed 32-bit integer to represent the size of the numbers in its output format. And we overflowed that in this number here. <laughs> and this was a really annoying bug to, to debug. Because how do you debug like this not being the right answer? Um, so we have <coughs> a patch to GMP that changes this to a 64-bit um, output size so that you can run this algorithm. Hopefully it still works. Yeah. I have another question as well. Like, why, why was Dan Bernstein thinking about this in 2004? So in 2004, um, he was actually using this as a pre-computation in the pre-computation step for the um, for the number field stuff. <coughs> so if you want to um, compute a nice factor base, you want to um, get a bunch of you, you take a bunch of numbers and you want to factor them all very efficiently. And so if you have a bunch of um, so. Normally you use sieving for this, but another thing that you can do is this algorithm. You take a bunch of numbers and you compute their, um, their pairwise GCDs, and then from the pairwise GCDs it's, it's easier to, to separate out all of the prime factors that they share in common. Any other questions? This is a fun exercise, by the way. So, um, it's, you can totally implement it in like 15 lines of Sage. And it works, and and, and it, like fifteen lines of Sage will totally do you up to several million RSA moduli uh, relatively efficiently. So, <coughs> everybody's happy. Um, okay, so now that we have our algorithm and our implementation, and um, we have our data sets, what does happen when we GCD all the keys? Um, you get the private keys for half a percent, or about 64,000 um, HTTPS servers, about 
0.03% or about 2,500 SSH servers, um, and two PGP users. Um, and you also find a bunch of invalid PGP keys due to some bug that I don't even know what it is. Uh, but it, it caused repeated bytes in the public keys that were clearly invalid. So we just showed this should never happen. So, so is, is that the PGP users, is that actually just, you know, randomness come back? The, the other things, I guess, they are like uh, more systematic errors, but this is so small that uh, was it just the two PGP users both generated their keys in 2002 and lived in German-speaking countries. And, uh, well, also, I mean, it's, it's not a sporadic error because we just showed that sporadic errors don't happen, so. If they were really, 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 really young. Um, I have a pointer to the implementation that was responsible to this, but nobody has been able to track it down. So I don't know exactly what the issue is, but it's it's not that okay. being unlucky. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Implementation issues. Yeah. So, we'll go into this later, but uh, do you have any idea of how if there's kind of an overlap between keys from one, uh, for one kind of system with keys from another system? For example, SSH versus HTTP keys. Do you, do you get any message between those, or is this like some sort of isolation? There was one, and that's a little bit surprising. It's, I mean, I don't know if somebody took a key from one system and put it on another, or whether there was like the same implementation that was generating both of them. So. Um, okay, so at this point you might be afraid, like all of these HTTPS servers, like is my bank, uh, do I need to be worried about my bank transactions here? Um, and the question is no. Um, basically, these are not the certificates that are being served on your bank. Um, when you look at the certificate subjects, so we've already seen some certificate subjects, so you're primed to, to understand what's going on here. These are clearly not bank certificates. These are things that say they are automatically generated certificates belonging to some kind of device. This is an IP address. Um, this is a router. Another router. Um, here's a printer. So these are the things that we're serving factorable um, HTTPS certificates. And um, it was sort of obvious just by going through every single certificate, and I went through every single certificate, um, which is not, I think, a good use of time. Um, but by looking at them. Um, the evidence immediately suggested that what we were seeing was widespread implementation problems. Um, and clue number one is that all of these certificates were, ge were clearly automatically generated by various kinds of devices on the internet. Um, and it wasn't just one company, and it wasn't every single company uniformly, but it was almost every company that has some kind of device. So every single name in the business had some kind of device that was obviously there. So there are more than 50 manufacturers, um, fun times. But it was also clear from looking at this that it wasn't like some kind of bug that affected everything uniformly because there were very different behaviors across different devices. They had different fractions of certificates that were vulnerable. They had um, different relationships between the primes that were dividing um, the factor keys. Um, so it was not like, we just found you know, a, a vulnerability in like the one thing that was being uniformly used to generate every single key on the entire internet everywhere, or even every single key that was being used to generate every device everywhere. There was something much more complicated going on. So it was not a single implementation that was vulnerable, and it was not every implementation that was vulnerable. It was some <coughs> implementations vulnerable in some situations that differed. So, um, so I'll, I'll illustrate this a little bit. Um, this is a, a very special case. This is not what most of the um, factorizations look like. Um, this plot, it's a kind of confusing plot, but each, um, each uh, column here corresponds to a single prime, and then each uh, square here, I hope you can sort of see them, corresponds to um, a modulus that was a product of that prime. And <coughs> so things are being double counted here. Um, and 
This is the number of moduli, so this is, I don't know, 20-ish, 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 20-ish. Um, and so these are all the different moduli that are divisible by prime number one, the most common prime. These are all the moduli divisible by prime number two, the second most common prime, and so on and so forth. Um, and all of these things were generated by um, a couple of remote access products distributed by IBM. Um, they're little cards that you can plug into your computer and you can uh, remotely administer your, your machine and, and reboot it and, and log into it um, instead of having to physically be there. Um, so does this, does this plot make sense? Um, so we have kind of a very uniform distribution of primes, um, but there's a small number of primes. So there are nine possible primes that were generated by these devices. Um, and each uh, modulus was a product of two different of those nine primes, uniformly at random. So there are 36 possible keys. Come on. Um, I heard uh, a, a little bird whispered in my ear that there was a, um, somebody forgot to dereference a pointer. And so the primes were actually being generated by like the top couple of bytes of a pointer. And that was what was going into the random number generator. So this is a very specific bug. It's a bug that is particular to this one implementation, this one company and their products. So. Um, this is a different implementation. Um, this is a login screen. This is what we saw for um, the certificates that were responsible for more than half of the factor keys. Um, these are the ones that look like this. So they say CN equals self-signed, CN equals system generated, CN equals some serial number. Um, so all of these guys, um, when you visited over HTTPS, um, the IP address associated with these things, you saw this login screen. Totally anonymous looking, it's unclear what this is. After a lot of Googling around, we figured out that it was a Juniper product, um, and they told us that we should call them the Juniper SRX branch devices. Um, and this is a plot which is trying to be similar to the plot on the previous page in the same way, except that it's on a log log scale now. Um, and but basically each column here corresponds to a prime factor, and each um, block in here is the modulus and the frequency of the distinct moduli that were divisible by each prime factor. Um, and so we have this very nice distribution of prime factors that um, this is clearly generated by some random process here. Except it's not a very good random process because we get a lot of prime factors in common. Um, but this is this is clearly a very different thing that's going on from the, the previous slide. So, all that makes sense? Okay. So if we go back to lecture number one, um, when I was telling you how random numbers are generated in software, we can imagine that, well, given all of the different random number generation vulnerabilities I outlined, maybe we found another one. Um, so here's the, the toy picture of, of how we, um, of how a, a system might be generating its crypto keys. It gets some entropy from hardware devices, the application seeds from the operating system and a couple of other things. It has its own pseudorandom number generator and then it generates the crypto keys. This was our, our cartoon picture from before. So what's going on here? Um, hypothesis number one, we're seeing all these devices. These devices are likely generating their crypto keys uh, the very first time that they've, they're being booted up. So you buy your router, you take it home from the store, you open up the box, you plug it into the wall, it boots up, it says, I don't have an SSH host key, I'm going to generate my SSH host key now. And it does that. Um, problem number two, if you think about your little router, um, it doesn't have a keyboard to get entropy from, it doesn't have a, a mouse to get entropy from, it doesn't have a hard disk to get entropy from. It might just have a little um, flash drive. And you might not have plugged it into the network yet. So all of the sources of entropy that the operating system is expecting to be there to um, seed are not actually present on 
these little embedded devices that we're seeing. Um, and step number three is, um, as I pointed out, it's kind of a hard problem for random number generators um, if an application is asking the operating system, please give me some output from your uh, random number generator, um, it might not have been seeded yet. And so the operating system can either say, no, I'm not going to give you output, or it can give some output. And as we saw, developers are going to choose the option that will not make their program hang, which is the one that will always provide output, even though it might not have been seeded yet. So. Um, one of the things that we found, we went and looked into Linux, um, and this is for dev random, um, and we found that there actually is, um, if you remove all of the, if you remove the keyboard and mouse and hard disk from a Linux box and then ask it, um, how much entropy have you incorporated into your entropy pool um, at certain times after boot and track this, um, this is what the plot looks like. So um, here is, in this dotted line, um, this is the entropy estimate function. Um, so remember that Linux is uh, heuristically estimating how much entropy it has mixed into its pool at any uh, point in time. Um, and then uh, using that to decide when it's actually going to take its input pool and mix it into the output pool. Um, so this function, um, this is, uh, seconds since boot, and this function, it is incorporating entropy eventually, um, but it doesn't think that it's meet, reached the threshold to mix um, things into boot until almost a minute after you've turned on the machine. Um, so this blue line here is the 192-bit threshold for um, Linux to actually mix the input pool into the output pool. Um, now this dotted red line is the number of bytes Red. So that's on this side of, it's the, the scale is on this side of the plot, but this is the number of bytes that are read from debu random after boot. And you can see that the number of bytes read out of debu random is enormous. Um, the operating system is doing a huge number of things that require um, random number generation um, immediately after boot. Um, and this red line here is when the SSH process starts and reads from debu random in order to generate its keys. And that is at second number four after boot. And so you can see that at this point, the um, operating system thinks it actually has 40 something bits of entropy mixed into the pool, and it's already requested um, uh, I don't know, a thousand bits of entropy um, from the um, PRNG, and it's trying to generate its SSH keys here. So um, for these, devices that don't have any input, for, for little embedded devices, um, there is a fairly long period after boot during which there might be no entropy at all in debu random. So the only sources of entropy at this point are the time of boot um, and the kernel string. Um, and many of these little routers don't even have a real time clock. So when they start up, the, the time will just be zero. So there you have what random number generation issues look like in practice. Um, now this explains why you might see repeated keys that are auto-generated by uh, little routers immediately after boot. Um, but it doesn't explain why we see keys that are sharing exactly one prime factor. Um, so if you have a pseudocode of how you might think to implement RSA, um, so your type implementation, you seed the pseudorandom number generator, you generate prime P, you generate prime Q, and then you multiply together P and Q and you get N. That's, that's your pseudocode implementation. Now if you're getting, um, if you have a bunch of different machines that are all giving, getting the same seed from the PRNG, you should get the same N. And that's what we're, that's what we're seeing for these <coughs> repeated keys. Um, and the repeated keys, if we're seeing repeated keys that are due to something like this, like everybody's getting the same seed from um, Dev U random, then that means that if you buy one of those devices and you plug it in and you look at the values of Dev U random, then you can actually just um, enumerate all the possible keys that could be generated by these devices. Um, but it doesn't explain why we're seeing 
different primes here because this is a deterministic process at this point. So the reason or one of the reasons why we're seeing different primes is because some implementations and OpenSSL in particular is doing this um, is adding additional randomness um, in between uh, generating the different primes but it's not adding it from a very good source. Um, so OpenSSL, this is the cartoon version of what it's doing. It's seeding from devu random and the process ID um, and the time. Then it generates prime P. Um, and in the course of generating prime P, every time you query a big num out of the entropy pool, it will add the current time in seconds to the um, to the, uh, to the entropy pool back again. And this is in a totally different part of the code from the code that I was showing you the other day. Um, it was not easy to find, and I've actually had arguments with the maintainers of OpenSSL about whether this code exists. But it does exist, and this is what <coughs> I'm doing. Um, so um, because of this behavior, um, the time in seconds is a really bad entropy source, but it might, um, if different implementations take slightly different amounts of time to generate their keys, it might provide just enough entropy to cause some primes to differ in the course of generating the keys. Um, so the, the picture looks something like this. So we have two devices, and they both start in exactly the same state. They have, they're starting at Unix time zero, January 1st, 1970. Um, they have the same state of W random, exactly. Um, so they get the same seed here. But then because processors take slightly different amounts of time to do slightly different calculations, there's a little bit of non-determinism, there's temperature, there's other factors, um, things, interrupts might be arriving from the network, I don't know. Um, stuff is happening that causes the actual clock time to diverge from the number of cycles that have been executed on these two things. So that the um, this device too is taking slightly longer. So um, it does each of these queries to generate the first prime P. And at, then when it starts generating prime Q, um, the steps that it takes, um, the clock happens to tick on a slightly different clock cycle. Um, from So this is the second time in seconds incrementing from 0 to 1. And the, the clock ticks here on a, on a different clock cycle. And at this point, the random number generators, the state of the pseudo-random number generator will diverge in these two implementations. And if this happens after you have generated prime P and during the generation of prime Q, then you will get the same prime P and different primes Q. And we experimentally verified that you can actually generate factorable keys in OpenSSL with no entropy sources but the time um, in seconds. So this is a plot of the experiment. Um, so this is, this is done on a, um, a machine with everything, everything turned off and the only entropy source to OpenSSL being the time. Um, and then, so this is at normal clock speed. Um, and this is the amount of time before the uh, clock tick that you start generating the key. And this is a color chart of the fraction of keys that are generated that are factorable. And you can see that um, I manually slowed time down in order to uh, make this um, appearance more, make the, make the effect appear a little bit more. So if you have a slow device, um, then uh, this slow device that starts, say, half a second before the clock tick, it starts generating its key, um, then I don't know, 0.4, uh, half a percent of, or about half, uh, 40% of the keys that are generated by something running at, say, um, 20 times as slow as, as my normal computer will end up being factorable because it happens to overlap with um, the uh, clock tick. Does that make sense? This plot is a little bit weird. So this is an educational process going into OpenSSL and trying to figure out exactly where all the entropy sources are. Um, there's little extra like um, places where they're adding the PID all over the place for no apparent reason. There's no systematic way of doing it. Is there a good definition for the lifespan of the picture? 
This one? Yeah. No. So here is where it's like overlapping the the second boundary. There you go. Okay. Now, there's some things that are unexplained here. Um, here are some of the prime factors that we found. I don't know what's generating this, but it's clearly not having any, any entropy. So they have random looking top couple of bytes and random looking bottom few bytes, and everything else is zeros. This is not being generated by OpenSSL. I don't know what's generating it. Um, here's some other. Uh, prime factors, they share large numbers of most significant bits in common. Um, not enough that they're actually vulnerable to any of the attacks that I know, but enough that something is going on here. That they're maybe generating primes in, uh, by incrementing a counter or something. Um, as far as the PGP keys, I guess um, this was already asked. Um, there's a particular implementation that appears to be vulnerable, but I don't have it, so I can't look into it, exactly what's going on here. Uh, okay. I am going slower than I thought. Um, okay, so what about Diffie-Hellman? So we just went all the way through RSA. Um, so Diffie-Hellman, um, this is the cartoon version, which you've seen multiple times already. I'm going to do all kinds of Diffie-Hellman together, so we have Diffie-Hellman mod primes, we have Diffie-Hellman over elliptic curves, um, but Alice and Bob are sending to do the A and G to the B um, for G some group generator of our group, which is specified <coughs> somewhere else in the protocol. So if, um, so there's a question, is repeating G to the A a vulnerability? Um, it's not always a vulnerability, for example, I mean, if you're not, if you're using non-ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, this is okay if you're intending to do that. Um, it is a problem if unrelated parties are sending G to the A with the same A value because then they know the private key A here. Um, and it's definitely a vulnerability if these repeated values are signaling some kind of entropy problem in generating this value A. So um, when we scanned TLS for the elliptic curve um, key exchanges, um, we got 5.4 million key exchanges, but only 5.2 million unique values for the um, values that were sent by the server. Um, and one possible uh, explanation is this <coughs> ephemeral static um, open SSL behavior where it says it's doing um, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, but it is actually um, using the same uh, it's, it's using the same G to the A value for um, a, that particular instance. So it's not per handshake, but it's per application instance. And so if you have a single application that's responding to multiple IP addresses, um, then uh, you might see this. Um, however, uh, we saw a lot of this. And the most common one was repeated over 2,000 hosts. So I don't know if that is actually um, if that's an entropy problem or whether it's um, some kind of thing that's responding to a lot of. So there, there are um, some devices that always present the same um, Diffie Hellman value, which is a problem if that's baked into the device and anybody can go and find it. Um, but there's a problem that this is much more difficult to look into than um, the uh, certificate keys. Um, so I want to finish up by talking about the digital signature algorithm. Um, so this is the US federal standard digital signature algorithm, but you guys are subject to it too because everybody uses it. Um, so the DSA algorithm, it's based off of um, discrete law. Uh, and so in the um, case of uh, groups mod primes, um, we have a couple of parameters. We have P of prime and Q which uh, is another prime order subgroup um, inside of the group of integers mod p. And um, g is a generator of this subgroup of order q. Um, 
and then we have a private key which is some value x and our public key is um, g to the x mod p, so some group element here. Now the DSA algorithm, um, it's randomized, so um, in each signature you generate a random k um, and then you have essentially an ephemeral public key per signature which is the value g to the k and then the signature itself is the value, um, we take the hash of the message, um, we take our private key, multiply it by r, our ephemeral public key, and then multiply this whole thing by k inverse. Um, and we take that mod q. So our signature consists of two values, um, this ephemeral public key and this signature value. And then here's the equations for verifying DSA. You could verify yourself that these actually correctly verify the Signature, I don't care that much about that part. So here we have the DSA signature algorithm. Um, if you're doing elliptic curve DSA, the picture is very similar. Um, so instead of having um, these uh, primes and groups, we instead have an elliptic curve group. And our private key is some value d. Our public key is um, some multiple of d times our generator of the group, uh, which is some point q. Um, and the signature algorithm is again very similar. You generate a random value k. Um, you take k times the multi a multiple of your generator, so that's the equivalent of saying taking g to the k. Um, you get you take the x coordinate of that, and then your um, public ephemeral key is um, essentially the x coordinate of um, this point. And then your signature is almost the same calculation. You have hash, hash of your message, your ephemeral public key times your private key, and then k inverse multiplied by that. So same picture. Just imagine that there's no difference between elliptic curves and, um, uh, and prime order groups. Now, um, what could go wrong with DSA? Well, if you have repeated public keys, so repeated values y, so assuming that all of these values are the same and you have a repeated value y, then if two hosts have the same public key, then you know they have the same private key, the same value x, and so they know the same um, private key for each other, and they can sign for each other. Um, <coughs> but there's an additional problem with DSA because the signatures are randomized, um, and it's actually, it's a little bit strange that the algorithm has this issue. Um, so uh, if you know, the, um, the, well, essentially ephemeral private key, but usually called a nonce for the signature, then you can easily compute the long-term <coughs> private key. So um, if you know this value k for a particular signature, um, so you have, say, r and, and the signature value, and you know what k is, then you can compute k inverse times um, uh, the hash of the message, you sub and then, um, you just solve for, and you know what r is, so you just solve for x here in this equation. So, that, so knowing k for a single signature can give you the long-term key x, which is actually one of the reasons why the Debian vul um, vulnerability was so um, damaging, particularly for DSA keys, because you might have generated your DSA key on a particular, like on a perfectly good random no number generator box, and you, if you've ever used it once on a vulnerable Debian machine with OpenSSL and generated a signature with bad randomness, then somebody could compute your long-term private key. So this is a strange property. Now, it is also the case that if you have two signatures that happen to collide in this value k, um, then you can easily compute um, the value k by, so you have s1 minus s2, you divide by the known values of these different signatures here, and then you could, you could solve for this value k and the, the computation is the same for elliptic curves. So then once you have this value k, then you use this equation here to solve for x, our long-term private key. So if any, um, if you have a, um, if you ever sign two messages with the same DSA key and two distinct messages with different, um, and the same value k, then you reveal your long-term private key. Um, this, this was famously used to compute the code signing key for the Sony PlayStation 3 um, a few years ago. Um, it was the uh, Chaos Communication Congress, Chaos Computer Club Congress, whatever it's called. Um, 
and Sony had failed to generate different Ks for all of its messages, so it's only using the same value for every message. Um, so what happens if we look for repeated DSA nonces? Well, we don't really have any um, TLS values for DSA keys, but we do get them by doing, we do get DSA signatures by doing a, our SSH handshake with all of the SSH servers. And so if we look for repeated DSA nonces on SSH host keys, um, we compute the private keys for about 1% of all of the SSH DSA servers um, and 133 Bitcoin addresses. So what's going on here? Um, we already established that there's entropy problems on first boot that might be um, causing different hosts to generate the same key. Um, but then we, um, we saw that you know, a few minutes after boot, even on a low powered device, you still expect the random number <coughs> generator to have been seeded by something. Um, so the problem that we're seeing is that if you start, say, your SSH process and it seeds its application random number generator at boot while um, the operating system's random number generator um, has a deterministic state, then the application will con continue to produce deterministic streams of numbers um, even if the operating system has then gotten more entropy by them. And this was responsible for at least some fraction of the um, SSH keys that we saw. Um, so what was happening was that you could basically, um, what was happening was that you would have, say, several thousand devices that would all have the same um, DSA private key as their host key. And if two of them, um, if, you, if you then queried a sequence of um, nonces from the signatures, you would see a deterministic sequence. And if two of these sequences were in the same state when we happened to scan all of these 10,000 keys, then the private key for all 10,000 hosts was the same and, and we would learn it. So that's the effect that we were seeing here. And what this looks like, um, so here's a plot, the most um, vulnerable device, the, the device that had the most uh, repeated DSA um, public keys was a Gigaset DSL router. Um, there were a lot of these in Pakistan, which was a little bit worrying at first, but um, it turned out just to be this particular device. Here's a log log plot of the number of keys. So the most, um, the most common one, it has uh, 10,000 um, devices with exactly the same key. And if two of these happen to collide in the signature in our, um, we did two scans, um, then we immediately got the private key for all of these guys. And so you can see that the more common the key was, the more likely we would see a collision in the signature for this collection of keys sort of petered out as keys got less common. So that's the picture to have in your head. Um, Bitcoin, it's both simultaneously more difficult to trace down um, what, the, uh, what the particular vulnerability is. It's, it appears it's a bunch of different things. Um, one of them is the Android Java random number generator vulnerability that was publicized in August 2013. This was not discovered by us. Um, there were a bunch of test implementations, um, which all just use the same value. There's also a, um, I think, name coin, something like this. There's some scheme that actually uh, uses uh, colliding signature values um, in the blockchain in order to, to do some kind of uh, other cryptographic protocol. Um, there's also some obvious developer error for um, some uncommon implementations. So one enterprising Bitcoin address has been scanning the Bitcoin blockchain and searching for um, signature nonce collisions and stealing all the money out of any account that happens to have a signature nonce collision um, for a couple of years. And they've stolen at least 59 Bitcoins. Um, so here's a plot of the um, different addresses that are sharing uh, signature nonces. And you can see that like many of them are gathered around, like they have, um, the red guys are, are vulnerable keys. And you can see that the, they, this seems to be one cluster of the same implementation. This is another cluster of the same implementation. And then there's some more sporadic behavior. Okay, 
So I will finish up by talking about um, the disclosure process. So we discovered um, a large number of vulnerabilities. Um, and so as responsible researchers, we then tried to disclose these vulnerabilities to the relevant manufacturers um, of these devices. So uh, we wrote disclosures to at least 61 companies. It's larger at this point. Um, this is the number of companies that I personally emailed, trying to say, hey, you guys have a problem. We're writing a paper about this. Here's how you fix it. Um, of those companies, um, 13 of them had some kind of security contact information. So who you really want to talk to if you have to report a vulnerability, you want to find the security team and email the security team and say, hey, we are security researchers, we are reporting a vulnerability. They'll understand what to do and they'll take it from there. Um, but less than a quarter of these tech companies had any kind of security team contact information available. Um, ultimately, we re received some kind of response that indicated that a human had read our message to less than half of the disclosures that we tried to do. Um, of those, um, half of them have actually told us that they have fixed the problem. Um, and five of them have informed us of some kind of security advisory that was published to the public um, about the issues. Um, I will say that if you have to do this again, don't email the companies yourself. Just get somebody else to do the, the disclosure for you. Um, and the way that I would do it if I did it again is going through CERT, the Cyber Emergency Response Team. So there's a few different ones. I think every country has their own, so you just find the one relevant to your country. Um, so there's US CERT, there's ICS CERT um, for the industrial control systems, um, which uh, there was um, one of the manufacturers that we contacted here made firewalls for power plants, and they independently contacted um, ICS CERT to report the vulnerability and, and uh, coordinate the disclosure of their vulnerability through ICS CERT. And then ICS CERT wrote to us and said, um, can you verify the details of, of, this, um, of this vulnerability? And we said, well, do you know about these other 60 <coughs> companies? And they were like, oh. So they actually went and tracked down um, some other companies like uh, cell tower, tower manufacturers for us, um, which was nice. So, and also did one through JP CERT for a Japanese company. Um, in contrast to the companies, um, the Linux kernel team is totally on top of stuff. So we sent them a copy of our paper um, and got a response from Linus himself within half an hour. And there were code patches flying back and forth um, by the end of the day. And within a couple of weeks, a patch had actually been pushed out to um, the entire community. So they were incredibly responsive. Um, we emailed secu the security team at, at kernel.org. So if you ever have to report something, that's where you that's where it goes. Um, so the the lesson here is that <coughs> disclosure is not easy. It's something that we are usually obligated to do as um, responsible researchers, but um, the companies don't make it easy. So here's a collection of vendor responses that we got. Um, this is just to illustrate like how it's hard as a security researcher to do these kinds of things properly. Um, so these are a lot of companies that had no idea what security research was and had no idea that, they, that we were not customers trying to get support on um, devices. So we had to tell them, like, we have no idea what these things are. We don't even, like, it's our best guess that they belong to you, but um, we can't tell you anything about them because I've never seen this thing before in my life. So. Uh, when running the testing, would you be able to provide the software on this device and the firmware on it, along with the model numbers on the back? It's like, no, I, I, I know an IP address, that's it. Um, attached is a document on the security that our product uses, and it was an empty document. Um, <laughs> and would you be able to give us the login credentials for the IP addresses? So, I mean, we, we wrote an, uh, a letter that said, you know, here, here's an outline of the issues, here's a link to the blog post that we wrote, Here's some IP addresses that we think belong to your devices if you want to verify that they actually are yours and see what the, what the models were. And so somebody wanted us to give them their, their login information over email. Um, what's your billing address? <coughs> so I can forward your email to the appropriate account executive. Um, and this is uh, one of the security teams who was um, mad at us. Um, 
it's a hard process. So most of the companies, the thing that they're worried about is bad publicity, um, for the most part. So if they are afraid of publicity, then they will respond to you. Um, we did not want to actually use publicity for this problem because it's not, I mean, it's a little bit obscure, so we weren't going to go to the New York Times and say, like, hey, um, I don't know. Um, another thing that we tried to do was disclosure to end users, so the people who had, like, pasted their S's, like, TLS keys into, from default certificates into signed certificates or um, pe people who were using device default um, keys that had gotten signed. And that was a really bad idea. Um, there were a lot of big companies that were doing this, but um, actually Zakir was the, the guy who was tasked with calling these companies, and they were even worse than the, the vendors that we tried to, to talk to. And some of them actually called him back and started yelling at him on the phone. They were gonna alert his supervisor that they were trying to hack them and stuff. So that was uh, not a good time. So don't even bother trying to notify end users, I think. Um, but generally, uh, I'm never doing personal disclosure again. I'm always going through some other organization. That is the thing that I've learned from this. So, um, the CERT, uh, CERT actually, they have like a 45 day disclosure policy. So um, if you tell them about a vulnerability, their standard is that they will um, 45 days from then publish a vulnerability report on it. And you can negotiate that with the company, but they will mediate the, the negotiation for you. Some people don't like CERT, but um, Disclosure individually to the companies is such a pain that um, it's really a much better <coughs> process. They also provide protection for the researchers um, because another issue that you might run into, we didn't actually get, we only got mild threats um, for, for this case, but one thing that happens to security researchers is that companies threaten lawsuits or injunctions or whatever against researchers who find vulnerabilities in their products to try to keep them from publishing them. And going through an organization like CERT is actually protection um, for that kind of, um, against that kind of lawsuit. But because by agreeing to be notified by CERT, the companies are agreeing that they will actually work to disclose vulnerabilities that are found. So another sort of practical issue that you might run into if you're doing attack research. Okay, so I was talking about press. So we were not the only team to do this research. There was another team that did it at the same time, um, which was led by Arian Lister, Jen Hughes, and, and a bunch of um, students and postdocs and researchers and like. Um, and they actually, uh, we were preparing our paper to submit to use next security and three days before the deadline, they went to the New York Times and told them that RSA is broken. Um, they'd done the same um, uh, uh, pairwise GCD calculation um, on the EFF SSL observatory and the PGP key data database. Um, so this is the article that resulted. So. Um, a team of European and American mathematicians and cryptographers have discovered an unexpected weakness in the encryption system widely used worldwide for online shopping, banking, email, and other internet services intended to remain private and secure. Um, so this was a little bit unfortunate, um, both because, I don't know, the New York Times is now saying that RSA is broken when it's not, um, and also because the real story was too subtle to actually tell to the mainstream press. Um, so there's a question in, like, what do you do if you find something really exciting? Do you immediately go to the, the press and talk about it? Well, for a lot of these security flaws, maybe the public doesn't actually need to hear about it. It's something that is worth telling to um, people in the industry, something like um, Ars Technica or CNET um, can write to technical people. But if you have a reporter of the New York Times who doesn't know anything about encryption, which you'd think that John Markov would, but I guess he doesn't. Um, and your story ends up being changed multiple times because the way that you get press coverage is, of course, um, usually your you know, university will send a PR person and they will write something that doesn't make any sense and they will send it to a newspaper and the newspaper will then write something that makes even less sense. And then people will read it and they will misread it all and then they will have a very confused idea of what's going on. Um, this is the way that, that press coverage works. Um, I have two recommendations if you end up doing this yourself. One of them is to essentially write the article yourself. Write a blog post that is correct. And then you put that on the internet, and then every, all the reporters who don't know what they're talking about will take things from your blog post and at least it'll be slightly more correct. 
Um, if you don't feel like writing the article for reporters yourself, um, the other thing you can do is find somebody who you actually trust and give them an exclusive. But um, I will say that press coverage does not come out of thin air. If something's been written about in papers, it's probably because somebody went to the papers and said, hey, I have a story for you. So if you want press coverage, don't just wait for it. Write a blog post or um, go to a reporter. That's, that's how the world works. Um, OK, so I should let us all go to lunch now. Um, but I will just finish up with at least a slightly positive story, which is that if you look at the percentage of keys that um, are factorable, it has been decreasing over time. So maybe the fixes have actually had a positive impact. Decrease slightly. Yes. Um, so these are the papers that I was discussing um, today. So if you want to read more about um, widespread weak keys in network devices or PGP keys, they don't actually separate out PGP keys in that paper, but um, they did that computation first. Um, or elliptic curve keys, then <coughs> here are 